Okay, next up is uh, Milana Blakemore from MPI. And she is going to give a talk entitled. You're not, you haven't changed your title, have you? No, I don't no. Okay. okay. Uh, floods, floods and natural disasters, days of future past. Thanks, Milana. Okay. Green arrow. Gosh, it's much scarier practicing um, the speech here than it is in front of my two children. But I shall do my best just to add that Andrew and Michelle have covered some of the points that I wanted to cover, so hopefully I won't take too long. So, Tanakoto Gatoa, um, Dobardan, good afternoon. My name is Milana Blakemore and I'm the manager for food risk assessment uh, at New Zealand Food Safety, business unit of MPI. Thank you for having me here. So, before the nerds and geeks in the room get too excited, some do, get some giggles. Days of Future Past is not about ever popular X-Men franchise or even with the relevant character of Storm. No, the reason I picked this title is that, as others have mentioned before me, the storms are coming time and time again. So although they are technically behind us, the impact still stands, so they're not really behind us at all. So what I will be talking about is my first flood, take you back a few decades, um, and flooding being a reality, as many have mentioned, and response through to Cyclone Gabriel through the eyes of NZFS and how do we better prepare for the future. So sorry for the blurry image. Uh, this is what I could find on Google. Uh, TikTok and drones and telephone pictures were not invented uh, when I lived there. So I'm a first generation um, Kiwi, immigrated here with my family in 1998. So I consider myself a Kiwi now, married a Kiwi husband, have two beautiful children. But I always call this home. So this is a picturesque uh, village which resembles many villages in the Balkan region where I'm from. Straight agricultural land, very popular for its Riesling, so any wine drinkers, if you ever go here, uh, have a glass of wine, I'm sure you will enjoy it. Um, and from the picture here, the picture probably doesn't do it justice. Um, agricultural land is such a broad term. I call it we were self-sufficient, self-reliant. So it involved everybody from, from children to the elders, where elders passed the wisdoms and kids learned and were involved in everyday tasks of agriculture. And when I say agriculture, it means growing your own food, making preserves, having stores, um, slaughtering animals at winter time, um, making your own cheeses, milking your own cows, so the whole shebang. The only time I remember visiting a store, fond memories of mine, is going to the store to, to buy a chocolate bar. Everything else we have made, uh, which includes even sunflower oil, flour, milling your own flour, and it was a little bit of a barter system. Not every household could do everything, so it was a big community effort um, and a way of living. So it's something that I use to try to get my children to, to empty out a dishwasher. And I say, you know, back in my day, I had to, you know, pick up pet chicken and, and see what we're going to have for tea or milking a cow and making sure that we have milk for the, for the morning. And it was boiled, by the way. It wasn't raw milk. So I just thought I'll, I'll add that there. But in the mid-80s, mid peak of summer, which something resembles the cyclone, uh, Gabriel here, uh, we suffered catastrophic floods, and not just my village, villages across the region. And as I sort of tried to explain and try to paint a picture, it impacted way of life. Uh, food was scarce. We didn't have necessarily the helicopters bringing in um, charities and foods, you know, the, the, the stores were gone, the jams, the preserve, the small goods, and the animal feed, um, animal feed. So it was a really devastating flood. So it did, did take a couple of years to, you know, recover, and people tend to use the word resilience, um, which, which, is, which is fine, but sometimes you have no choice. So it's just, you go through to survive, right? So as I said, suffered a flood, a couple of years later, the village elders, for the lack of better terminology, and some um, councilmen um, looked at and discussed how we can prevent or minimize the impact to our little village. Uh, and here are a couple of examples. Uh, thank you, Mr. Google, for these. Um, on the right here is we didn't really have um, the water 
drains as we do in the bigger cities. So these are the man-made canals that surface around every, every street and much, much bigger canals surrounding, um, surrounding the village just to try to minimise the impact of any future floods. And the picture on the left here is what cleverly some of the village people did, is they actually build animal feed stores on top of the animal housing just to prevent any, um, you know, mould, everything that, every nasty thing that happens um, through flooding. So, so that I thought I'd just introduce myself in my first storm. So, future, few, few decades, the impacts of storm and extreme weather events uh, everywhere. They're more common and the magnitude of flood is much bigger. Which I guess brings me to January, February floods of last year. I picture that was a thousand words. I don't think I have to tell everybody the impact that the floods have caused. So I won't delve into that, um, but I know that Lives and livelihoods were lost, pets, animal loved ones, and people are still recovering. But furthermore, horticulture sectors, marais, churches, infrastructure, supermarkets, some are still impacted to this day. So in terms of the New Zealand response, again, I'm only looking at it from New Zealand food safety perspective, but there were a lot of agencies trying to coordinate it because we weren't really prepared, let's be honest. Uh, flooding was just something we used to see on TV and it hit us and it hit us hard. So, you know, how do we come back from this? And obviously some of you guys have already mentioned this. So a number of agencies, NEMA Police, Regional Councils, Iwi Hapu, Animal, animal Rescuers, Charities, Defence Force, NPR and New Zealand Food Safety. So it's only the third time in New Zealand history that it's been, we've declared um, state of emergency and which just goes to show the, the extent of the flooding and the impact it had. So in terms of the cyclone Hale and Gabriel, um, first and foremost, we wanted to ensure from the response perspective that during and immediately after that staff safety and welfare was most important to us. But as you can imagine, the communications were disrupted, and not just us, you know, in our cosy offices up in the Wellington, it was disrupted for everybody. So it was a really stressful time, and, and I really appreciate and respect for um, all the work everybody's put in to get the infrastructure back, to get the comms back on. We needed to ensure that uh, leaderships and ministers were abreast of situation, just to see what, what advice we were giving um, on, on a, nearly on a daily basis. And although it wasn't a particular food safety event, it had a big food safety impact or part that we had to play. So the, the response team within New Zealand Food Safety coordinated uh, a lot of um, work that has come through. So I will not go into the, the chemistry and the micro detail of them, I am not either. Um, but just to say that some of the guidance and advice that we have provided uh, and worked quite closely with industry in some instances to provide this guidance. These mostly are available still on our website. So general fresh produce being a big one, wine, apples, honey, supermarkets, food rescues, home kill, and even uh, general public um, guidance because as you can see if people are not able to reach a supermarket and all they have at home is their you know potatoes and vegetables to grow then they needed to know about potential risks from the floodwaters. Floodwaters. I don't think I need to dwell into, into this too much. They can be contaminated uh, with a, a range of things including sewage, dead animals, decaying plants, chemicals of different nature pesticides, oil from a tractor, pathogenic microorganisms, I mean Michelle was mentioning Hastex and Salmonella, viruses, potential parasites in the water too, but also some physical contaminants that are more visible to identify. It was a tough time. I think I was just a baby at New Zealand Food Safety. I haven't been there even a year. And my ad, Roger, left me alone and he went overseas. So 
just throwing it out there. So <laughs> there was quite a lot coming at the same time from everybody wanting advice, wanting the guidance. So it was quite a difficult time, and I'm not taking away the stresses that everybody felt actually on, on the ground. Um, but us in Wellington, we had to really produce some guidance documents. However, there's quite a lot of considerations that we had to think about. Sorry for the wordy slide, but in terms of type of hazard, is it microbiological of nature? Is it chemical? Is it physical in nature? Location, I think Michelle uh, mentioned it. Uh, you know, there's different hazards and different risks depending on the field you're looking at. I mean, that could be one kilometer apart and the risks could be very, very different. Uh, what are the local hazards on your farm? What are the upstream hazards um, that the flood water is bringing? And also testing. I think this was one of the contentious topics. Test or not to test and to test for what? And what is the testing going to tell us? Type of produce, different risks based on if you're having a potato, if you're having an apple. Um, it's based on you know the level of splash and submersion, and then of course a favourite friend, silt, has come on as well. In some instances, it's one of those silver linings, and it's is brought in quite a lot of nutrients to the land. But at other instances, you know you're knee deep, and you couldn't really replant or salvage anything. Mold and aflatoxins as well, following the flood. I don't think I need to go into too much detail. And another. <laughs> Another consideration, big consideration, was market access. Of those fruit and vegetables that were salvageable, did the industry have confidence to export that produce overseas? Oh my God, two minutes, okay. Uh, and, if, and if they did, um, and it didn't meet uh, overseas market requirements, it wouldn't necessarily be a black mark against their name, it would be sort of a black mark against New Zealand uh, fresh produce industry as a whole. So it was a big consideration. Anyway, challenges or questions. Um, what, are, you know, some, what are some of the food safety risks? When to harvest, when to replant, and persistence of contaminants. And, and Michelle mentioned it quite well. In terms of re research to establish baseline data, there isn't a point testing if we don't have any baseline data. So we need to have surveys in different regions on soil, water, um, to, to get a baseline that will hopefully better inform uh, a guidance or at least refine it for New Zealand context. So in terms of what can NZ Inc. do, you know, as, as government, we're looking at best international practices. So. Uh, like-minded people were trying to connect, comparing and contrasting things to New Zealand context. CRI's universities, other research institutes are carrying out research. We want to see how that research is being utilised and industry bodies are trying to provide guidance to their members and in sharing, sharing said research. But I think one of the most important things we need to do is look at the emergency preparedness uh, and that's not just for one industry, it's for all of us, uh, even even us in, in government, we do this. We like to use a fancy fancy name, but it's really just emergency preparedness, business continuity plans. It's just identifying hazards, seeing if is it a, is it a real risk. Not every hazard is a risk. Um, if this hazard is to come to fruition, what are the impacts on your business? How can you minimise it? What are the learnings? and how do you ensure that you maintain such plans so your staff are all across it and know exactly what to do. And it could be as simple as having hierarchy of communication because sometimes in emergency, you know, you do get mass panic and you may miss a certain person, so having the hierarchy of communication I think is quite important. And not to be an alarmist, uh, I think Andrew was using the same thing here, it's not just floods. Um, you know, we, we have droughts as well, floods, earthquakes, New Zealand is in a precarious geographical location, we have four seasons in a day, uh, you know, ring of fire, volcanoes, tsunamis, it can hit us all, so what can we do to prepare better? We all know through, through these scenarios, transportation is limited, as we have seen, loss of power, we have seen, communications disrupted, we have seen this, and also workforce availability and mobility. There is no point having somebody to go and pick your apples if you can't actually get your workforce there. So what are the plans if this happens in the future? Um, and resources to get you started. Sorry, last slide. 
It's just there is a horticulture food safety initiative uh, which many agencies across Australia and New Zealand are part of. I do, Fazana is around here somewhere, so do come and talk to her. I think it's, a, it's uh, like-minded people um, looking at hazards and how do we prepare better for the future. Uh, MBI has, MBI has extreme weather research database where you can load up some of the research because what we have found is that a lot of research happens but nobody knows what is happening. So it would be really great to know, you know what left hand is doing and what right hand is doing so we have a central way forward. Uh, maybe not as relevant but there is a, a data catalog and there is a cycling Gabriel and last but not least, NPR website has quite a lot of um, lot of information to get you started in terms of planning for natural natural disasters. Oh, last sentence, I promise. So as I stand, <laughs> as I stand, I did say as I stand here today, I look at many modern age uh, village elders, as I'm going to call you, regardless of how what your age is. And, and I hope to utilise your, your knowledge, your expertise, so people can collaborate, cooperate, work together so that impacts in the future can be, can be minimised. Thank you.